record everything. So welcome everybody, excited to have you in class today. My name is Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center, and I'll be your guide in the questions and the chat as we go along today. So today's class is all about constitutional conversations and civil dialogue. And we are so excited with what we're gonna dive in today. First, we're with Jeff Rosen, our president and CEO. We call him our fearless leader. He's gonna guide us through this discussion. But we also get to talk to Professor Philip Poppett, who is the guy who wrote the book on methods of exploring constitutional questions. So Professor Bobbitt and Jeff, I'll turn it back to you. And just Professor Bobbitt, your camera looks off. So I just wanted to clarify that real quick and get your camera back on. Okay. <laughs> So as How's we start that? to kind of go, oh, there we are. Awesome. So without further ado, Jeff, I'm going to turn it over to you to kick off the conversation for all of our students. Thank you so much. Hello, friends. And uh, Philip, Professor Bobbitt, it is so wonderful to welcome you to the National Constitution Center. We're so grateful to you for sharing your light and learning with our wonderful students. And let me begin by congratulating you on your Honorary knighthood, which you just received ah. from the Queen. Uh, congratulations, Thank you. very well deserved. Thank you. Thank you. It's well. It's a real honor to be here, Jeff. So so glad to um, be able to talk with you, friends. As Curry said, uh, Professor Bobbitt is the leading authority in America of the methodologies of constitutional interpretation. We've been talking since the beginning of this class about the importance of separating your political from your constitutional views and uh, deciding not what you think the government should do, but what the Constitution allows or forbids it to do. And to figure that out, you've got to pick a methodology of constitutional interpretation. And Professor Bobbitt's um, book, uh, Setting Out the Methodologies, is read by students in the leading law schools in America. I teach it to my students. So, so there's no better person to run through the methodologies with than Professor Bobbitt. So if, if we might, wh why don't we just put them all on the table and, and I'll ask you to explain uh, them and uh, just to set them out. And I wanna make sure that I uh, have them in front of me. Uh, we have our methodologies, which include text, history, <coughs> uh, uh, structure, doctrine, prudence, and ethos. Those yes. are the main categories. So let's walk through each of those. Um, text, what, 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 what methodology is that and what does that involve? The text of the constitution, it was felt by the framers and ratifiers was the surest way to make uh, certain that government observed the limits on its power. Text has a power to embarrass someone who wants to get around the rules of the constitution because everyone can understand it. A textual argument construes a part of the written constitution according to what people take it to mean today, what those words mean to the average person in the street. It's not a, a recondite or very complicated or sophisticated, or not a historical interpretation about meaning. It's the ordinary guy or woman was just asked about a piece of text. What does it mean? History, which is often confused with text, is very different. Before we get yes, to history, if, if, if I may ask a, a question to, to uh, clarify. Um, Curry just put in the chat box, um, a judge looks to the meaning of the words in the Constitution relying on the common understanding of what the words meant at the time the provision was added. Is that correct? Or should the, ju the textualist oh. judge look at the, t at the text as it would mean to a reasonable person today? No, that's not correct. Now, okay. sometimes it's the same. Yeah. 35 years meant the same thing in 1787 as it means now. Sometimes it changes. The declare war clause means something very different to people now than it did to the ratifiers. Now, most people think it just means a precondition to war. I'll give you another example. In the uh, recent uh, second impeachment of Donald Trump, I uh, irritated so many of my friends by saying that you cannot convict uh, a president who is no longer a civil officer. You can impeach him if he's still in office, but if he's no longer in office, he can't be convicted because the text of the Constitution says that only civil officers can be uh, impeached and convicted. Now, that's just a textual argument. It doesn't reflect my political views or what I would prefer. 
Great, great example. And uh, Professor Babbitt, I think your camera is off again. If you could try to, there we go. Perfect. Um, okay, I'm glad I asked for that clarification. So friends, just to review again, um, despite what we put in the chat box, a textualist judge looks to the meaning of the words in the constitution relying on the common understanding of what they would mean to a reasonable person today. Tell us about history and how that's different. History um, depends upon uh, a following idea. Like uh, uh, the proceeds of a transaction between uh, uh, partners, like uh, the uh, things given to people through wills, when a deceased person leaves property to someone, we ask what did the people, the people who either endowed the state, by state I mean the United States, what endowed the government with power intend to give that government? Now, that doesn't necessarily mean 1787. It could mean uh, one of the most recent amendments, for example. It could mean the, uh, any of the 14th, the 15th, the 13th Civil War amendments. So it's the time of the adoption uh, marks the moment of examination. And you say, what did people intend by this provision? How do they want their intentions uh, manifested in the acts of government? Very interesting. Is it right to say that judges who call themselves originalists uh, look to history and that this category would encompass originalist understandings? Yes, it is. And, and of course, there's an important debate among originalists about whether you look to the intention of the framers of a provision or the ratifiers or the original public meaning of the clause at the time it was ratified. How would you help us think through that from a historical perspective? I think it's uh, a slightly false uh, uh, argument. Uh, put aside the framers. Much as we revere them, much as we look to them to see what they were telling the public uh, was being adopted, it's really the ratifiers, because like the testator in a will, it's the ratifiers' power that is being given to the state, not the framers. They're just the draftsmen. They're just the lawyers. Now, if you say, well, do we want to know what was inside their minds, which is pretty hard to find, or shall we look at what the words meant to people who are their contemporaries? And that's a debate in the academy, but as I say, a slightly false one, because really one of the best ways to find out what was in their minds was to see what those words meant to their contemporaries. I'm, I'm so glad I asked, and now I understand why it's important to distinguish that historical approach, which looks to what the words meant to contemporaries at the time the provision was ratified from the textualist approach to means uh, what, what, what it means to people today. Very helpful indeed. Let's turn to our next methodology, which I think is structure. The Constitution sets out a number of structures, some uh, bicameralism, for example, the Senate and the House and the Congress, uh, the three branches of government, the judiciary, the executive, the legislative. It sets out a system of dual sovereignty, uh, the federal government and state governments. But it also sets out other structures, the structure of the national economy, the relationship between the citizen and the state. When a judge or a lawyer or a public citizen is trying to construe some structural question, for example, uh, can the president remove a person he has appointed to his cabinet who has been confirmed by the Senate without going back to the Senate? Now, that's a, that's the kind of uh, problem that is almost uniquely suitable to structural argument. You want to say, well, what were the... Why do we have this structure? Will a decision one way or the other promote the efficiency and the success of the structure? Because if I come up with an answer that cripples the structure, well, then I'm not really being consistent with the Constitution because the Constitution's first purpose is to survive, to be a, an instrument of a more perfect union, not one that is collapsed. Very uh, helpful. Um, is it right to say that the Youngstown case, which talked about how the powers of the president are highest when they're supported by Congress and lowest when they're not, is that an example of structural constitutional interpretation or not? 
Jeff, I think you must know the answer to that. <laughs> Youngstown <laughs> is a very famous example. Not so much the majority opinion, which is a pretty straightforward textual analysis by Justice Black, but the concurring opinion by Justice Jackson. <clears throat> You've already quite accurately summed it up. Uh, Jackson says that if a president wants to, in this case, seize the steel mills because uh, steel workers had gone on strike and we were in the midst of the Korean War and we needed steel for armaments, if a president wants to seize those mills and he has a statute behind him authorizing him to do so, his powers are at their highest. He has the congressional authorization to act. If, however, he's acting on his own, his power is, is not so great. But there are provisions that allow presidents to act on their own. For example, the pardon power. On the other hand, if he's acting where there is no power explicitly allocated to the executive, and the Congress has either not spoken or has spoken to the contrary, or has refused to adopt language that would empower the president, then his power is at its lowest. That's a structural argument of great mastery and very famous. Wonderful. Thank you for explaining that so clearly. Uh, tell us now about doctrine. Doctrine is precedent. And I've got to make sure with my uh, Texas accent, I get that exactly right. <laughs> it's precedent, P-R-E-C-E-D-E-N-T, not president like President Biden. Precedent has to do with case law that has either been decided by courts, that collected and bound volumes of reported decisions by appellate courts and by the U.S. Supreme Court, by state courts. Or, and this is sometimes missed, the doctrine of precedents that also govern in the executive or in the legislative. There are examples for ex uh, to come to mind of presidents who have followed a certain pattern of decision making, for example, about advise seeking advisory opinions from the Supreme Court. That goes right back to George Washington at a decision that he made, and executives have followed that rule really two and a half centuries uh, since. So doctrine is that set of rules, and most importantly, the rationales for those rules that have been relied upon by previous constitutional deciders. So interesting and so important to learn from you that doctrine includes not only Supreme Court precedent, as you said, but also executive precedent and that that the other branches have followed. Um, one of the biggest questions in constitutional law at the moment is uh, whether Roe v. Wade will be overturned. The court is going to decide that this year. And um, tell us about the tests of whether or not to overturn a precedent which the, the court has identified at least three of them. First, is the decision workable? Second, are there reliance interests that have developed around it? And third, are there changes in facts and law since the decision was made that would justify a change? Is that right? And, and, and how do judges think through those factors? I think that's a good, that's a good rough and ready uh, summation. That, that, uh, I, I, would, uh, I would urge our students to think of one other factor. Uh, when uh, a young lawyer or, or a newly appointed judge reads a governing precedent, a case like Roe versus Wade that is supposed to be applied, before we ever get to those three tests, we want to look at the rationale for the rule. The clumsy lawyer, the inexperienced judge, just looks at the holding, what the court decided. So the court decided that uh, a state may not outlaw abortion before a certain number of weeks of pregnancy. But that's, as I say, that's a very crude and not a very thoughtful way to do it. You really want to go back to the opinion and see what the reasons were. Now, in Roe versus Wade, those reasons have changed. And so, although the press talks about overruling Roe versus Wade, and many politicians do, that's really sort of a shorthand for overruling Casey a later case that greatly modified not the holding, but the rationale for uh, uh, criminal abortion cases. That's such a crucial point. Friends, I, uh, just to repeat what Professor Bob had said so that we all 
emphasize it, um, the, what we should look at in deciding whether overturn a precedent is not simply the rule, but the rationale and the rationale can change. And I taught Roe v. Wade just last night at the GW where mm -hmm. I'm teaching this term. And uh, we read the decision out loud and we tried to identify each of the arguments of the majority and the dissent in Roe and Casey. And it was striking by how many students found themselves more persuaded by the equal protection rationale than the privacy rationale. Many students said uh, restrictions on abortion impose burdens on women that are not born by men and restrict their life choices in a way that men's life choices are not restricted. That was a different rationale than the one the court embraced in um, Roe. How, how, how should a justice who's more persuaded by the equal protection rationale than the pri privacy rationale think about how to whether to overturn or modify a, a precedent? Well, I think the uh, the initial position probably disfavors overruling. As you say, there are reliance interests. People have come, they've changed their laws, they've changed their lives, they've changed their business and social practices to conform to what is the current doctrine. And unless there's a good reason to overturn that, there's a certain dispreference for doing so. Roe versus Wade is uh, an interesting example that I, I would say right now you must have some very uh, fine students because that's a that's an excellent way to look at it because the initial opinion is really I th I think most people would agree sort of a mess uh, the the rationale is uh, not very convincing but that doesn't mean that there aren't convincing rationales and the equal protection argument is is I think uh, uh, one of them. Thank you for that. The students are superb. And friends, as you're listening, you see why it's so important to learn these methodologies, because you may find the initial rationale for a decision unconvincing, but using your methodologies, uh, find a different rationale that's more so. So that's why we have to continue with our methodologies. And the next one, which is important, is prudence or consequences. Tell us about that. Prudence is just uh, a way of saying, is the decision practical? If you have a... Uh, uh, a court, uh, perhaps a, a court of uh, persons who are, as all officials must be, uh, uh, against violence and war, uh, and you decide that you're going to disempower the Pentagon for two years because you think the budget adopted for a weapon system violates the two-year limit on appropriations for defense, step back, <laughs> sit down. Uh, the practical consequences of that would be so destructive of the government that you really want to apply your creativity to seeing how you can make that work, how you can reaffirm the constitutional value at issue and without doing violence to it, but still don't, don't cripple the defense and deterrence policies of the United States. Excellent. So we need to a, a, a judge who's focused on questions of prudence, but ask about the, its practical consequences. And of course, Justice Breyer is uh, perhaps the most uh, noted pragmatist on the current court who emphasizes the importance of practical consequences. What about concerns about institutional legitimacy, how the public will perceive the court as a nonpartisan institution, which Chief Justice Roberts has emphasized? Is that a prudential approach as well? Maybe. Um... <clears throat> I've thought about this this class, which, as I say, I'm I'm very uh, honored to uh, participate in, and I thought if there was one thing I wanted to get across, it was the remarkable origin story of the Constitution and how it bears on legitimacy. The Americans faced a really unique opportunity. On the one hand, they were writing on a blank slate constitutionally. They had done away with the monarchy, they'd done away with aristocracies, they'd done away with oligarchies, all that's in the phrase, all men are created equal. They had come up with a truly novel constitutional idea, the idea that the state, which in Europe was regarded as the lawgiver, would be put under law itself. Now that's not in any of the great European philosophers. That is an American idea and it is our perhaps our greatest contribution to civilization. But if you have a really novel idea like that, how do you get buy-in 
from so many different groups of people in a society as diverse as ours. Even in the late 18th century, we were quite a polyglot uh, people. Uh, and there were sectional, class, uh, and ethnic and religious differences. So where does legitimacy come from if it doesn't come from the fact that the new government or its practices are justified by the arguments I've just given? And the answer is, at the same time we wrote on a blank slate constitutionally, legally, we'd been given several hundred years of practice. What the Americans did was to take the kinds of argument that had been used to construe property deeds and wills and contracts and agreements for employment and shipping and merchant disputes, to take those forms of argument and then apply them to the state. Hmm. And people were quite comfortable with that. They were very much at ease with historical arguments. What were the intent of the testators here? With textual arguments, what does that contract actually say? With structural arguments, where you had different bodies uh, in the private sector, employer and employee working out their relationships. Obviously with prudence, the, the stuff of their very daily lives, the, the ethos of the Constitution expressed in the Declaration of Limited Government is so novel, so creative, that I think it might never have gotten off the ground. If we didn't, at the same time we had a blank slate, we had methodologies that had all this accumulated practice. Lawyers were at home with it, judges were at home with it, and they felt at ease uh, uh, so that our people were at home with it. And that's the source, I think, of legitimacy. It's different from justification. It's different from what you would prefer and how many people agree with you. It's what people will defer to, what they will axiomatically accept, even when they disagree with the actual decision. That's remarkably clarifying. Thank you so much for shining that light. And it's an extremely important point that I had not thought of before, and I want to emphasize it for our friends. Professor Bobbitt just said that the great radical innovation of the American experiment was to subject the state to the rule of law. And one way that we did that was by applying the methodologies of private law interpretation, contract, and so forth to the Constitution. I, I just hadn't realized that those methodologies did come from that tradition of private law. And I'm so grateful to you for emphasizing that. I have some follow-up questions about that important question, but I just want to make sure to put on the table our final methodology, which is ethos. Tell us about that. The ethos of a culture or its, its habits, its social mores, um, and it's different from culture to culture. The, the ethos here is not that. It's not the American creed. It's not um, American values or, or American uh, cultural preferences. It's the ethos of the Constitution. And the ethos of the Constitution goes back to the Declaration of Independence. I have friends, you and I have a mutual friend, Akhil Amar, who's very cross that people don't ever read the Constitution. Well, one reason they don't read it is because it's so boring. Most of the Constitution is really quite dry and quite technical because it really is just a set of bylaws. It, it is a way of making a more perfect union than the Articles of Confederation towards realizing the values of the Declaration of Independence. So if you want to find the American constitutional ethos, you really look back to the Declaration, ideas of limited government, that no man is any man's sovereign, that the United States will be an independent state with all the powers of an independent state, that there are rights that cannot be given to the, to the government. We call them in lawyer's language, Jefferson was a lawyer, inalienable, but not everyone knows that to alienate means to sell or barter or give away. And there are powers that we cannot even give the government, even if you wanted to. The government could not tell me how to vote, even if I voted for people who passed a statute directing me how to vote. Uh, what a, what a, what a, what an inspiring um, encapsulation of the, the ethos approach.
Um, and you're telling our friends that it's it's rooted in the Declaration's idea that we have certain un, unalienable or inalienable rights that inhere in us from from God or nature, and they impose certain limits on government and on uh, guarantees about our rights and duties. Now, this ethos approach is sometimes invoked by those who say that uh, natural law uh, can plausibly be enforced by judges, including natural rights that aren't explicitly written down in the Constitution. And of course, natural law is very malleable. Some might invoke it to support the right of the individual woman to make fundamental decisions about her body and the other, the inalienable rights of the fetus who they claim has life at the moment of conception. Is it right that, not, that this ethos uh, approach might empower judges to interpret natural law in, in very different ways? Well, there's a great division about this in academia. Uh, I've come down very hard on one side. I would say no. And the reason I say no is because the, uh, the ideas of natural law, as important as they are culturally, uh, are not ideas that have ever had the imprimatur of our people politically. You, an, an eloquent person like yourself can state an argument for a natural law, really for both sides of most controversial issues. And in law, we want to be decisive. We want to make a rule, settle a disagreement, and, and move on. In philosophy and jurisprudence, the uh, open-ended uh, conversation is usually a characteristic of debate, but not in law. So what would be an example of the kind of bounded ethos-based approach that you think is legitimate? I sometimes teach a case called Moore versus City of East Cleveland. Uh, the City of East Cleveland became very concerned that hippies, I don't know if our, all our students know what a, what a hippie was, but that uh, uh, rather rebellious uh, student age uh, persons were going to live in communes in the city of East Cleveland. And they felt this would be very disruptive to the social fabric. So they passed a rather silly uh, municipal statute that said that persons who weren't closely related, uh, father, mother, husband, wife, son, daughter, grandson, granddaughter, if you weren't within that very tight circle, you couldn't cohabit in a single structure, a single house. Now, as I say, this is a very silly idea because uh, we all have come from families that uh, have lived in, with, I was very close to my cousins growing up. Uh, people lived next door on farms and, and in villages who were quite closely related, but we're not that, we're not just husband and wife, father and son, and mother and daughter, but some uh, blockhead actually prosecuted a woman who was living with her grandson and her great nephew. Uh, hard to explain, but it happened. This went up to the Supreme Court. Now there was no case on point because it's such a silly statute. No one had passed a statute like that and it had been adjudicated on before. It was such an absurd prosecution that there was no doctrine saying that prosecutors can't uh, uh, put people in prison for and fine them for infractions of this kind. So the author of the opinion, Justice Powell, talks about the American tradition of the extended family and talks about the American ethos of limited government. And he says, I don't have any case law to cite here, it's not really a matter of the structure of the government. There's nothing in the text because the people who wrote the text would never dream that, <laughs> would never dream somebody would do something so silly. Uh, it wasn't discussed at the ratifying conventions because it wasn't really an issue. But I know this is incompatible with the ethos of the Constitution that leaves people alone to decide their family and personal matters for themselves. What a powerful example. And that leads me to ask this question, which I wanted to ask after our discussion in class last night. Uh, one of the foundations for Roe v. Wade is a case, is of course, called Griswold versus Connecticut, which held that married couples have a right to use contraceptives without being banned by the state. 
And Justice William O. Douglas famously derived a right to privacy from penumbras formed by emanations from different constitutional provisions, including the first, fourth, and fifth amendments. I was having trouble in class fitting that approach into your methodologies. And uh, some called it penumbral textualism and others a structural argument. Is it an ethos argument or is it in its own category? And was he doing his own thing? Where would you put Douglas's? I think it's a very frank prudentialism. And it sometimes helps uh, to look at the body of work with a particular judge. Uh, Douglas was a thoroughgoing uh, prudentialist. And uh, Griswold makes the following argument. It says, this is not a textual argument. There's nothing in the First Amendment that protects uh, the use of contraceptives. But the First Amendment protects free association. And what kind of uh, associations would we have if the, uh, if the police could interfere in their marital relations between husbands and wives? He says, now, this isn't within the text of the Fourth Amendment. It's not an unreasonable search and seizure. But how could we protect against unreasonable searches and seizures if the police could uh, set up cameras in marital bedrooms to see if contraceptives were being used? He, he runs through each of these textual commitments and says, they don't mean anything as a practical matter if you allow the police to do this to married couples. That's so helpful. I did not uh, understand that uh, last night, and, and, and now I do. And um, the next case, um, the Eisenstadt case, said if the right of privacy means anything, it's the right of the individual, married or single, to make fundamental decisions about whether to bear or beget a child. Is that also a prudential argument, or is that something else? What's the basis? I think that's a doctrinal argument. I think it takes Griswold, and it says the principle in Griswold is not limited to its facts. It's not just that it is offensive and overreaching and incompatible with our ethos to surveil married couples' private lives. It's actually offensive when the people aren't married, when they're just individuals deciding with whom they plan to have children or have sex. And then one more question, the obvious next one. Roe v. Wade located a right of women to choose to bear or terminate a pregnancy in the Liberty Clause of the 14th Amendment, but as we discussed earlier, it's not very clear about which methodology it used to reach that conclusion. Which of the methodologies, if any, do you think supports that conclusion? Well, I think the conclusion can be uh, supported uh, on the basis of the following ethical argument, an argument from ethos. And that is that government may not coerce intimate acts. Uh, they, they can draft you to the army, they can make you pay taxes, uh, but they can't make you marry someone. They, if, if a couple divorces or is seeking a divorce, the domestic relations judge can't say, I think you two belong together. I order you to go back and cohabit. <laughs> you, you can't do that. If, uh, if a teacher of a sex education class uh, decided that she needed something more graphic to illustrate what she was talking about. She couldn't direct two of the students to come up and start uh, making out. Uh, we don't allow government to enforce, of course, intimate acts. That, I think that's a, a sound ethical principle from the constitutional ethos. Well, then you have to ask yourself, what is the most intimate act of all? Uh, uh, we have four young children, uh, as you know, Jeff, and uh, the the nine months of pregnancy, our, our last two were twins, and there were some complications in that pregnancy. Uh, for any person who's gone through that as a, as a woman or anyone who's observed it as a man or anyone identifying in some other ways ever seen that, I don't think it's very controversial to say that carrying a child to term is the most intimate act any uh, human being can undergo where your own body is, is nourishing and growing new life. Uh, I, I think that's uh, a very sensible way to, uh, uh, to, to get the core of what intimacy really is. There's nothing that can surpass that. Well, if that's true, and if the state can't coerce intimate acts, then the state probably can't force a woman to carry the term. Now, the holding in Roe versus Wade is a little different 
because it doesn't say the state can't do that. It's, it puts limits on what the state can do. After a certain amount of time, the state can insist a woman carry the term. And I think the way to look at that is that the woman has waived her rights. If, if she wants to terminate her pregnancy, fine. Doesn't want to be coerced into carrying the term, fine. But at some point, the state steps in and says, we're here to protect the, the life of this uh, fetus uh, or almost an infant. So that's how I would do it. Uh, so uh, important to hear you say that. Um, and, and what about that equal protection argument that my uh, brilliant students last night found more convincing? Is that a textual argument or would you put it in some other methodology? I think it is a textual argument and I think it's a good one. And uh, uh, I, I say I applaud your students, your students for that. I also think that in, in building an argument, in, in trying to uh, construct the superstructure of a rationale that will persuade people who don't begin by agreeing with you, it's helpful to have more than one argumentative basis for uh, asserting your, your views. The opinion I teach most uh, extensively in my first year con law classes is McCulloch versus Maryland. And I have the students go through part one and tell me what kind of an argument is this? What kind of an argument is this? We go right through every single sentence of part one because they're all there. I, I sometimes think of this, uh, of Chief Justice Marshall as this uh, conductor uh, uh, coordinating this symphony, you know, uh, up with the timpani, down with the horns, you know, <laughs> as he takes you through history, text, structure, all the way through into ethos. Then I teach part two, and part two is just one brilliant a soloist. It's a structural argument about, about the state power uh, to see the contrast. But I think the most powerful arguments are those that marshal more than one form. So important. Uh, uh, Professor Robert, I am so uh, loath to close, as Lincoln said, because I'm learning so much from this conversation. I'm just going to have one or two more questions, Curry, and then turn it over to you, friends. Thank you for uh, joining us as we learn from Professor Bobbitt. Um, would you tell the students then, um, can they pick and choose which methodology they find most convincing and all are legitimate, but, but you're saying that um, a decision that's supported by more rather than less is likely to be stronger? Maybe. Uh, uh, I think as a general matter, that's true. Marshal all your forces, uh, coordinate them, put as much mass into the battle as, as possible. However, there are cases when a particular kind of a problem is most suited to a particular kind of argument. Uh, for example, the requirement that a president be 35 years of age when inaugurated. Now, there may be some prudential reasons for that. We think of a 35-year-old as more mature than a 12-year-old. But is she or he more mature than a 33-year-old? Well, I don't know. It depends on the, on the person. Uh, there's not much discussion in the, in the history of the provision. Uh, some people think that it was to prevent the sons of presidents from being elected. Because by the time someone was president, his, his son would uh, not have been uh, 35 or would not have been under 35. Uh, there isn't much evidence for that. Uh, I, th I think if you just say, look, it's in the text, it's perfectly clear, let's move on to something else. That would be an example of just using one form of argument because it's so devastating, it's so totally powerful. Now, some originalists, which you've helped us understand, are, are making a historical argument claim that that's the only legitimate methodology and all the other considerations shouldn't enter into a judge's decision. Uh, do you agree or disagree with that? I strongly disagree with it uh, for a couple of reasons. One is, if the originalist is to be guided in her or his choice of a particular argumentative ranking, or in this case, just one particular form of argument, then presumably there'd be evidence that this is what the framers and ratifiers intended us to do. Is there historical evidence that 
it was the intention of the ratifiers that their intentions be the only constitutional uh, form of argument. And as a, a mutual friend of ours, Jeff Powell, has quite convincingly shown in a very important article in the Harvard Law Review, that is exactly, <laughs> that is just exactly the opposite of the truth. And we know that from the Federalist Papers. The Federalist Papers are the best source for the original meaning, both the original public meaning and the intentions of the ratifiers, because they were the advertising to the ratifiers. They said, this is what you're getting if you sign on to this new constitution. And the Federalist Papers themselves show the full array of constitutional arguments. They do not limit themselves to what was proposed at, uh, uh, at Philadelphia. Now that's, I think, a fatal argument for originalists. And there are other arguments. Uh, one last question with, with great uh, reluctance, but uh, I think this is gonna have to be it. When you uh, encapsulated the methodologies for your pathbreaking book, Constitutional Fate, what, what were your sources? Did, did you look to private law methods of interpretation and discern these methods and find that the framers intended them to be used? Or you're, 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 uh, uh, you made a central contribution in distilling these methodologies. How, how did you find them and what were your sources? Well, I'd like to say that I had this whole beautiful story I've just told you when I was uh, writing this book in my uh, late 20s, but it's not true. It's taken me a lifetime to, <laughs> to get to this particular account. Uh, the actual truth is I had been a philosophy student uh, as an undergraduate. I thought about going on in philosophy, and I was trying to combat what philosophers used to call the correspondence theory of truth. The idea that something is true only if it matches up with something in the world. So a constitutional proposition is true if it matches up with the text or if it matches up with the history. It's some discernible fact is what validates a, an argument. And I believe that this was a, a false account of language, that language and the language of lawyers and judges was really more an activity, something that was created among them and that changed and that there were many thoughts and propositions that did not have an external referent, but that could still be determined to be true or false. And some years after I wrote Constitutional Fate, I decided to stop calling these forms, forms of argument, and I call them modalities of argument because a modality is something that determines whether a proposition is true, but is not true or false itself, like a, a, a measuring stick. It determines how tall you are, but it itself it does not determine how tall it is. Uh, Wittgenstein made a famous remark, what's the only thing in the world that is neither longer or shorter or equal to one meter? And he said, the golden meter in Paris, because it's the model for all the others, but it can't be a model for itself. Hmm. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that origin story of these crucially important uh, modalities of interpretation. Uh, Curry, uh, back to you for just a few questions from our friends. And I think we're all blown away and loving this so much and just so grateful that you're helping us build better tools to have a civil conversation and a civil discourse. And one of the questions from Vicki, it was kind of a statement, but it it harkens back to the question our students that we were teaching last week had. If we help more students and more people understand these modalities, I love that, that's perfect for education too, will they be more likely to agree with the court's decision and legitimize the court and understand where the courts are coming from when they choose these methods? And say, I might not agree with your method, but I get how you got there and I respect it. What do you think about that? I think that's a tremendous, a tremendous value. I, I think uh, the idea that uh, each of us has a lock on truth, including the truth of legal propositions, is really quite uh, fanciful uh, because all of us have changed our minds. If you can't appreciate other people's arguments, then you can never change their minds. Uh, I, I teach these forms of argument not because I want to brainwash my classes and get them to agree with me, but so they can uh, express their own convictions, their own uh, 
political, moral, spiritual, social conventions as, as uh, commitments as they want to. But they won't be able to do that if all they can do is just talk to the people who already agree with them. Love that. And this is why we, this course and this week's class is so important. How do we engage in conversations that brings everybody to the table to hear different perspectives? And you, you listed so many beautiful norms in there that you're listening to each other, that you're not there to move them over to your side, but for them to really share their perspectives with these methods, these modalities in the Constitution. Are there any other great norms that our teachers and our students can walk away when they have a constitutional conversation, which we kind of charge them to do in homework today, when they're at their kitchen table or at the, at the park or in the car with each other? Well, I guess uh, I sometimes uh, tell a story about Benjamin Franklin in the last uh, day of the convention. He had opposed uh, many of the ideas of the convention. And the Delegates to Philadelphia saw him as one of the leaders who had doubts about the, the new government. He's, he, was, uh, he was not well. He didn't live many, many months beyond this. Uh, and he stood up with some difficulty and supported the ratification of the proposed convention. And he said, some of you may be uh, surprised at this. And he gave the reasons why he changed his mind. And he said, and then he said, and also, I have learned in the course of a long life that I'm sometimes wrong. Absolutely love that. Thank you for leaving on that idea that we come to the table respecting others, but also knowing our own humility. So thank you so much for this class. We all feel so honored to be in uh, class with you today. Thank you so much and for I having me. I think I'm pretty sure I took a million notes as we were going through. So thank you so much. Jeff, thank you so much for leading such a great conversation and the amazing examples you both gave all of our students. And we'll make sure everybody gets every case that you guys mentioned because it was pretty impressive. Thank you I'm both. So, thank thank, you, thank Jeff. you so much, uh, Philip, uh, for shining so much light and for inspiring our students to grow in wisdom and learning. Thank you. Hope to see you soon. Love to see you. Yeah. Thank you, Kara. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor Bobbitt. It was great.